Well, hello. I'm Good Heidi morning. Burgess, and I'm sitting next to Guy Burgess, oh, and yeah. it's April 14th, 2023. And I should have said that I'm with Beyond Intractability. And today we're talking with DG Mon, who is president of NAFCOM, the National Association of Community uh, for Community Mediation. And uh, we want to first thank DG for taking the time to come with us, talk to us. And we'd like to start by getting you to tell us a little bit about what NAFCOM is, a little bit uh, about the history and, and mission and how you're structured, that sort of thing. Absolutely, thank you and good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, NAFCOM, the next association, uh, was developed by members in 1984 and to appreciate the desire of a grassroots developed national group by a group of folks is to have a little appreciation of the history that our the shoulders we stand on are the individuals that said yes to section 10 of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that said any community that has a disruption, disagreement or disturbance, everyone in that community has a disruption, disagreement or disturbance and the best people to address it are those involved in it and those impacted by it. And so a really strong sense of, while there may be great outside information that can help inform on processes, that the actual rightness or readiness to do it must be community-driven and community-led. After that act was passed, funding arrived through the Nixon administration, which is in 1968, to, and went through the counties or cities to establish and support community groups. They did not call themselves community centers. They were dispute centers, neighborhood centers, neighborhood boards, dispute councils, a variety of different names. And the names were connected to how those in the community would best name themselves. They were set up in a way to help communities in dispute that didn't need to go to civil or small claims court. So instead of going through a court system, needing to get a judge, needing to get an attorney, if you were recognized by that county or city, and many counties and cities did, as the appropriate body for deliberation, what you would do is fall with that government, here's what happened, here was the issue, here's how it was resolved, and best as we can tell, as long as the resolution wasn't illegal, the counties and cities were thrilled to accept it. They didn't have to pay for a county attorney. They didn't have to worry about court dockets. No one was being arrested. Police weren't involved. There was no jail time for anybody. And best of all, for these individuals, there was no permanent mark on them that a crime or a conflict had occurred. What they did was really resolve it in a way that they could live and co-create together what they wanted it to be. And this went along for more than a decade, spread throughout the country, uh, mostly in northern and western states, not as much in southern states. And so when the Carter administration came along, they were trying to think through how can we entice southern states to be involved with southern communities, both answers being one of them, how can we entice them to become involved with this and move that funding from county government to judicial government? Having an appreciation of President Nixon's history coming from California, he recognized the power of county government. California counties are extraordinarily powerful and therefore coming through them would be the best avenue. President Carter, coming from Georgia, recognized that many counties were minority-led, that county government wasn't always responsive to all the residents in the county, but the judicial system was, and therefore felt that was a better fit. In that movement came the movement that, well, then we need to professionalize these mediators. We need to make sure they're licensed and they meet standards. What I point out to people in our history that the federal government has been doing mediation since the 1880s. If they wanted mediation as we know it, they would have said it. They didn't, they said to mediate. They did the verb. 
when President Johnson signed it, he, the reason for that word mediate was he wanted to create a core of American peacemakers. And peacemakers are people who come in and help people find a balance, help people figure out how I can live with the situation and change it together without harming other people in that change. It was only in the late 70s, early 80s, that it became a very professionalized field. And that's why, and I point this out, hallmark two of being a community mediation center is anyone can be a community mediator. You don't have to be an attorney to do that. Must you go through training? Of course, you're learning how to hold space. However, you could be someone who, because of your situation, didn't matriculate past the eighth grade and be an amazing community mediator, someone who never could get themselves a law license. So that tension began to surface after that decision was made. In the 80s, the funding was stopped, mostly from the history we've been doing because our centers were then and still are very different. They represent the culture and the community they serve. They represent the people who provide the service. So a um, part of American culture is wanting it to be the same thing every place we go. Pizza Hut is Pizza Hut is Pizza Hut. In our world, that center needs to represent, am I serving the indigenous population? And therefore, what I'm going to offer may be really different than if I'm serving the urban population in Chicago. They shouldn't be the same. They in fact, we would want, want them to be the same, which is hallmark one is you must be representative of the community you're serving. All those things went into play that between the 80s and 1994 when AFCON was created, many of the centers to survive were becoming programs of the courts so that they could get some resources. The problem of becoming programs of the courts is we were started out with a significant purpose. There is no justice in the justice system for everybody. If you're a program of the court, it's really hard to point to the court thing. <laughs> you're being a little unjust here when the court could say, you know, I'll just find someone else to do this. So by 1994, those that still held on to the vision and mission of human mediation, that is, we are about community mobilizing. All of us should be able to have the talent to lean into conflict and figure out what that means for all of us, founded NAFCOM. And they founded NAFCOM to say, we need a national group to amplify our voices because we're busy doing the work in the community. We need a NASH group to aggregate our wisdom. We have no idea what's going on in the next city or the next state or the next part of the country. We need a national organization that can help us make those connections but something amazing may be happening that I can do in my own community. I just didn't know what was happening. So amplifying that voice, ampl aggregating the wisdom, and then advancing the work of community mediation. All of our centers are no longer, and about 90% of our centers do mediation as we know it in the United States and Canada. Almost 70% do restorative justice principles. And this is from 2018, so I'm sure it's grown. More than half do facilitated dialogue. Almost 90% do training on how to sit with conflict. And nearly half at that point did coaching because it's so hard to get both groups in. So why not give hope and work with the group that can come in? So what we are about is making sure that none of the centers are put into a box. And that has been the problem. Because in our culture, we like to be able to say, this is what it is and nothing more. And we say what we are are our values. We're curious, we're collaborative, we're about respect and hope, we're about integrity and quality. We're about the vision, again, that all of us can be mobilized to sit with the conflict and move with it, co create with it. How that looks may be very different. And the last thing, just going quickly through the hallmark, is we're also about system change. So not only is it why is the issue happening, let's make sure those involved are able to figure it out, lean in. But now let's step a bit, take a step back and say, 
What in our systems, in our culture is facilitating this? What is making this occur over and over again? That unless we address that, it's not going to stop. And that leads me to something of recent writing you all did, where you didn't use these words. I used them reading your work, that if we're in a culture of deficits, if you win, I lose then we're always going to fight for me to win and you to lose. Right. If we're in a culture of abundance, which is what community mediation culture is, we all can win here. We can come out of here better than how we enter. Then you're not sitting in that circle saying, I'm losing something. You're sitting in that circle saying, I'm willing to put the doll down because I've grown up and I really want this toy instead. And then move forward with that. And that's a writing you put out just recently that really inspired me that one of the systems issues, cultural issues, is this win-lose culture as opposed to a culture that says, we have abundance. We have abundance. You sharing your powers, what you talked about with someone else, doesn't diminish your power. In fact, from our perspective, it increases your power because the only power we have is over ourselves and to influence others. It will actually increase it when you share it. Thank you for letting me go a little on. I hope it wasn't too fast. I just find many people don't know that history and how it fits in and wanted to be able to put that out there. That's great. I've got several questions. Great. Um, going back way at the beginning, back, back to the Nixon era, the thing that I heard, and I'm wondering if this is true, is that the only way you got funding is if you had a crisis. And if you were going along with a pretty healthy, stable community, you couldn't get funding. Is that true? Not necessarily. What you had to have was the county board or city government willing to share its power. You okay. had to have a judicial system, wouldn't share its power. Imagine a judge saying, okay, Gary, you can handle these cases. You know, you, you're not an attorney. You haven't gone through judicial ethics. So you had to be in communities where both the, either the county or the city government and the judicial system was willing to say, I'm going to share this role and responsibility with Gary and Heidi, who have no training, no background, but the community seems to like them. Okay. So that's what really drove that decision making. And and what kind of issues would they deal with? It was all based on the research. It was all over the board from very small issues: people not mowing their grass, people not not painting their buildings, to much larger issues of why can't I go shopping here. Why, why, why am I only told I can be on this side of town and not go to that side of town? And when I go to that side of town, I'm harassed. And so how do you bring those groups together to talk about why, why does it make you uncomfortable when DG shows up in Gary and Heidi's side of town? Let's sit and talk about it. What does Gary and Heidi think they're losing because DG's showing up? Why can Heidi and Gary gain if DG shows up? So they were all over the board. And I think the reason why is what was each community ready to actually say it doesn't have to go through a court system to be resolved? And so it was really reliant on that. So in most of the counties and cities, there was civil and there was small claim that they were willing. No criminal. We still don't do criminal. That's, that's of the alternative dispute resolution, otherwise known as the court system. They definitely do the criminal Sort of, because many of our people do restorative circles, which in fact are working with people who have done crime. So again, I think it really relies on the, the foresight of those community leaders to recognize all we're doing is building more jails and all we're doing is complaining about more of a caseload. And if we could actually empower the community to sit with its own issues, Maybe we don't need to build any more jail and maybe we don't need to worry about caseloads. And it really takes that level of vision for the centers to really grow and, and survive and thrive. So 
when you started, you said in 1984, did I get that? 94. 94. But you're good, Heidi. There was one in 1986 and it didn't stick. And then they started one again in 94. So that maybe you were channeling that first one. Well, I, for, I remember that there was something called NAFCOM, which I think used to stand for National Association for Family and Community Mediation. And then that got rolled into SPIDER, which changed into ACR. And then from what I heard, you broke off from ACR. Is that correct? That is not correct. So I'm glad okay. we're here to, to clear what I know of the history. Now, this part of the history comes from our elders. Uh, we did interview folks about seven years ago who was around at the beginning of NAFCOM and also lived through the merger that created ACR. And let me begin by saying ACR is an amazing partner with NAFCOM. They're actually helping support our first assembly ever. It's going to be a day and a half assembly in Arlington, Virginia, to try to bring us all together. So do not hear, we didn't join that ACR as any diminishing of the power of that organization and our value of that partnership. However, when I talked to the elders, the reason why we didn't, again, going back to the the whether it's European, U.S., North American culture of wanting things in a nice clean box is the attitude they were experiencing that community mediation is a field like court law is a field, like family law is a field. Right. And our elders were, no, community mediation is how you hold that space. Do you see the powers held by the attorneys and the judge or the powers held by those in conflict? If it's B, you're a community mediator. It's how you approach people. It's how you help them feel brave to be able to be in their truth and say what they need to say without going, oh, you better not say that. If that gets into court, X is going to happen. Well, unless we say that, unless we talk about that, this problem is going to keep going, coming in a variety of different sideways. So what they decided was if they joined ACR, they would be acquiescing that we are a type of law you may practice. And back to our hallmarks, anyone can be a community mediator and everyone at any time would benefit from having a community mediator facilitate the conflict they're in. Going back to the Civil Rights Act, it said anywhere there's a dispute, disagreement or disturbance, you need to do something. You don't need to wait for its right for a court case. You don't need to wait for, oh, I see you violated some law. And now we can actually do something. You're to do it the moment. So their decision, and it, from what I understand, was a very difficult decision. It was a very intense conversation. And NAFCOM operates by consensus. So it took quite a few meetings to get there, but got to know where we need to stay separate if we're going to hold on to why our forebears did what they did, believed what they did in the late 60s to start us. Okay, that sounds like a better story than the one I had. Well, it's um, one of my elders, it's what our elders told us. So I don't, I wasn't there, can't, can't validate the facts of it, but I want to believe them because we talked to a variety of them and they all came out, they had different perceptions of what caused some of that angst in the conversation, but the underlying truth in all their stories was we need to stay true to who we are and we're not a discipline of the law. We're not for attorneys only. We've got to be able to look at ourselves in that broader scope. Makes sense. So how many community mediation centers, using that term very loosely, I members of NAFCOM are there? Well, there's there's probably twice as many centers that there are, are NAFCOM members. We we hover around 350. It is, we, we believe we estimate it's twice that number. And that's okay because NAFCOM is an association that you belong to if you wish to. There's no requirement to belong um, to NAFCOM and still say you're a commission center. We have our hallmark any member of ours need to be able to follow them and, and live them out. So that's 
roughly the number that that's out there as best as we know we'll never know the exact number because it's not something that states necessarily certify so we really don't know who are in there some states do washington oregon new york uh, all have a process that does that uh, michigan does as well nebraska others do not so it really um, depends on where you are so have those states have a process to certify um those states when um when the federal government in the 80s decided that they didn't want funding to go this way they wanted to go a different way those are the states that stood up and said this is too important to our state and california does the same thing but again california is very county based so there isn't a state process it's really up to the judicial circuit to decide what is and is not and that california culture um, the other states i mentioned all said this is too important to lose and we're going to fund it and well that was another one of my questions for the states that don't have that kind of state support um where do those organizations get funding um through a variety of avenues when we ask them the questions it's all 2018 and 19 so it obviously could have changed it was pre-pandemic a lot of the funding came from the united way agency in the community it would come from their bar association attorneys would recognize that this is a great thing to have in fact we have several bar associations who are NAFTA members because they want to know what's going on and what's happening we have several civil rights organizations that are NAFTA members so every community went to and goes to those foundation those funders that that believe and support that our community needs this mechanism needs this ability to address conflict without leaving a stain on someone's life forever and address conflict in a way that that can create a path forward that is sustainable even with that being said there isn't one center that doesn't do major fundraisers that do dance-a-thons and run-a-thons and all these things to keep funding at a level that they can keep team members it's another it it the advantage i suppose is one of our hallmarks is this that you must bank in the community that means volunteers and we have many centers that have over 100 volunteers each that are doing this work in their community because we don't want to become so professionalized that we lose our anchor to the very community we're supporting and that that's a real drive for admission centers you can't be coming down from the hill to help the folks in the valley you need to be supporting the folks in the valley to run their own center and do what they need to do excuse me um one of the questions that i suspect a lot of people and especially people who are a little bit skeptical about this sort of thing are likely to be asking is if you have a system that pretty much is open to anybody to serve a mediation role of some type. Uh, what are the quality control mechanisms that you have in place, standards of practice? Uh, what measures in this very loose and changing and community focused and adaptive process are there in place to assure that what comes out of it is a, a good solid process? Right, absolutely. And that's one of the things we encourage states and communities to have their centers become part of NAFCOM, because those hallmarks really are what we expect from our centers. And we do check in, uh, we do check ins every year just to see how things are going, what's going well, what isn't with anyone who's a NAFCOM member. Um, and, and just briefly, because I've talked about them a bit, the first five are really looking at the center itself. How anchored are you in the community? How ease of access do people have to your services? What services are you providing and why? What community members need them? So you're not just providing what you're good at, you're providing what the members are comfortable in, in setting that stage. How open you are to a diversity of folks, including perspective. I read another piece of yours that talked a bit about that political divide. And in if, if you look at our history, our history actually comes out of a Republican funded president because the belief that the best resolvers of issues are those closest to it. 
So when you look at NAFCA membership, we're all over what I would consider the partisan perspective. Politically, we are fairly similar. We, we believe in the value of each person. We recognize the value of each person. We recognize that what they say is their truth and that our, our coming together isn't to argue about that. Or are coming together, so what do we do with that truth? How can we co-live? How can we co-create? That is your truth. So those are the first five. The, the middle two are really looking at how well do you work with others in the community? How well are you a place-based organization that is connected to all the other folks doing social justice work, doing um, community engagement work, doing um, peace creation work? How well are you connected to those and working with them so that those who are doing it well, lift them up. You don't need a program to do it. There's a group doing it already. Let's make sure the folks who come to your center know about this other group can go there. If there's a gap in that support network, what can the center do to facilitate a growth of a service that meets that gap? So it's how well do you work with others in the field? And of course, how well do you work with the judicial system, how well are you connected with it? So they know, as I said, we have many bar associations who are members. They clearly know the value of community mediation and the value of having that center in their community. And they want to stay on top of what's the growth in the field, what's happening, what's the cutting edge. And the last two of our hallmarks, which we look for in our centers, do you Take the time to initiate, educate, and facilitate conversation about making sure your systems are positive in how people encounter them and leave them. And if not, what needs to be changed? And we've worked on, on reimagining safety and what needs to be changed. We worked on the social dynamics of health and health discrimination in this country, access to health. We've worked on immigrant issues. And what does it mean to be an immigrant in our community? We've worked on discrimination with older adults with our centers. We've worked on a variety of issues, foster care as well, that the system needs some tinkering, needs some strengthening, needs some assessment. And then, of course, that last hallmark is making sure you're letting the world know of the value you're providing so other people know they can access it. And quite frankly, that last hallmark, I think, is their connection to NAFCOM. Okay, how well is NAFCOM letting the world know how well we're doing? Which, again, I realized it was before we recorded. Why I am thrilled, blessed that you're giving this opportunity for folks that you know that listen to you to go, my gosh, I had no idea that this was already going on. I don't need to create a new hub. I need to connect to what's there and let's see how that can strengthen what I want to do. Because we, we don't advocate for particular issues. What we advocate for is that everyone can be heard. And there's a difference in that advocacy. So lots of groups need to keep doing what they're doing because we're not going to go there. You provide training for new centers so that they can get up to speed on, on some of the primary strategies that the old timers have been using for a long time? Yes, in, in, in twofold. One is a bit passive. We hold uh, monthly webinars and they're on the back ends. So people can listen to them at any time. And many of our centers use that for volunteer training. So they can download the webinar and have their volunteers sit through it. We also meet monthly with whatever centers want to around topics. We've done a lot around houselessness and dealing with those issues and have had lots of what's the cutting edge, where should we be going? We also, thanks to uh, funding through the Trust Network, which I know we're going to talk about on a different video, that funding has ended, uh, was to develop emerging centers. And that was to really, for centers that really became programs that want to go back and re-embrace what does it mean to be anchored in the community. And for communities that their program went away decades ago, and realize they really want to start something new. We call that in the emerging community process. And it's a six month process where those going through it receive expert technical assistance from two leaders in the field that know what they're doing. 
using an outline and manual that the Jams Foundation funded for NACM to develop more than a decade ago. And then they get a bonus at the end of $500 and then $500 six months later if they're still percolating to help them cover some of those initial course of becoming a 501c3 or doing some marketing or whatever, however they choose to use those funds. We were very blessed to have the Packard Foundation do seed money for that. Um, and now the Janus Foundation has picked that up as part of their funding. So we can do that. If people are inspired to move forward, they need a place to figure out what does that mean? How does that look? What does it mean that we are the most structured, unstructured system? We have these hallmarks. We need to follow them. That's our structure. But we're unstructured. And so what does your community really need? And so part of that emerging community process is we teach them how to do reflective sessions. So they are listening to the community and the community is guiding them from the very beginning. Here's where the needs are. Here's where the gaps are. Here's what we really need someone to lean in and help us to figure this out. And we've had our emerging centers grow uh, exponentially. We, we, whether it be Cincinnati, whether it be Montgomery, Alabama, whether it be Sarasota, Florida, whether it be Macon, Georgia, Atlanta, I know I'm missing people. That's the bad thing. I'm doing well, a list in your head. The, the we have many emerging centers, yeah, that are doing great, great work. The thing that struck me as interesting is most of your examples that you just pulled out of the air were in the South. And you were saying that early on, you didn't have that many in the South, but the ones that and, came and we, quickly Excellent were. point. Thank you. Uh, the ones in the South, because when we received the funding from the Packard Foundation, we wanted, uh, with some guidance, wanted to look at areas where voting and access to voting was an issue. And so we initially targeted to helping develop emerging communities in Georgia, Florida, and Alabama. So that's why those are initially in the South. We've had, and South Carolina, let me not forget them. We've had Emerging Center in Los Angeles come up that's doing amazing work right now with the mayor there and the whole issue around homelessness, that was an emerging center that went through our process. So we have begun to go back out to the rest of, of Canada and the United States, but the initial funding was to try to focus on particular states that were very much in the news of having some type of barriers to people accessing the franchise of voting. Uh, <clears throat> this raises a larger question of uh, to what degree has your work been disrupted by this larger hyperpolarized politics that's taken over the United States? And most of the examples that you've offered thus far are mostly small scale disputes. Are you getting in the middle of or doing anything to try to diffuse this larger um, polarized politics that's making so many other things so difficult? I hear that I, I want to, I hear the question about polarization and I'll get to that. I want to go back to my examples. My apologies if they sound small. I think helping to make sure uh, during the George Floyd trial that that stayed the issue and not the anger of the community members being small, I would say that that's not so. We were right in the middle of it. Our centers were right in the middle of it. Helping the mayors of large cities, whether it be Chicago, Los Angeles or New York City really look at houselessness or relation to law enforcement. So my apologies that my examples are small. I didn't want to leave it there as the impression. So I can certainly sit with uh, the more larger systems example that our communities have done. If we look at Dayton and the whole reimagining of what does it mean to be a part of policing and there they've started a whole program that if the call comes into 911 and it isn't emergency, criminal, life and death, the call goes to the community mediation center and they send folks out and they have amazing stories of the difference that has made in the city of Dayton that when the community goes out, they're not having to arrest, they're not, they're not immediately thinking you're the criminal they're sitting down with you. I remember one example, and again, this may sound small, 
where someone had been sexually violated and the police said if we had been called out, the immediate thing, because the person was being very angry, would have been to arrest the person, to arrest the woman. Instead, the center came out and did coaching. What's going on? Can we talk? What's happening? And really peeled back so much for that individual and why that individual could not go home and then was able to have the individual choose, I would like to go to the hospital. So here's a person where law enforcement said our only option would have been to arrest because they were not leaving the, the bench. The center was able to come out and get the, the person to choose to have hospital care, no arrest record, no, no sitting in a jail cell, no, no again compounding the trauma. So I just wanted to, to make sure you saw some of those bigger things. Back to polarization. And you live in Colorado, maybe a very different state than here in Kentucky. But I look at the polarization as this has always been. There's always been the significant division in my state. And so part of what I've worked with is how do we help still hear each other over the noise that my experience has been is mostly facilitated by people not in the community. And that's part of what communication is about. We're going to deal with the folks who live in the community. So if you're really angry and we are dealing with lots of school board community issues, if you're really angry with the books in the library and you live in this community, come on, let's sit down and talk. If you're really angry with the books in the library and you come from two states over, you're not in our community. Doesn't matter what you think about our library. Go to your school, go back to your community. And so really, we have looked at, we dive into these bigger issues, as I said, twofold. One, let's deal with the conflict in front of us, and then let's help them deal with the system. And we have with partnership through Living Conversations and through uh, the Carter School and funding now through the AAAs, our beta testing, a, a toolkit that our centers helped us create. I'm calling it a toolbox, a variety of tools in there that may help a school system, may help a community, advocacy group concerned about education, figure out how do we hear each other and how do we develop a type of going forward that isn't a lose-win, but is one that people are okay with. It may not have been what they would have designed on their own, but they can live with it. And that's the standard we use. Can you live with this? Are you okay with this? The answer is yes. Let's keep moving forward. Because tomorrow there's a chance to make it better. It doesn't have to be, I didn't get everything I want, therefore I lost. Because what we work with is what do you want? And just to go to the schools in the work we do with them, it doesn't seem to, as long as from the community, it doesn't seem to matter what position you're taking, how polarized it may be. At the end of the day, people want their kids to get an education, and they truly do want their children to be safe. And so if you stay focused on those values and then develop, so we call that a disruption process, we're coming in to really focus on what do we care about? We care about children, let's talk about it. We're not going to talk about should every teacher be armed? Should there be red flag laws? We're talking about what do we want for our children? Well, we find by that, disruption, that change, allowing that to happen, it allows people to get close to each other, allow people to see each other as having that same care and concern. And then once they see that, now they can actually hear each other. They may adamantly disagree with your response. However, they can hear it. And so what they're not arguing with you and your response, what they're asking is, tell me how that's going to make a difference. Tell me how by doing nothing has made a difference for the last 30 years. So tell me what we can do that makes a difference, right? And so when you approach it from that community perspective, as opposed to the judicial, we have two sides, don't say these things, you're giving things away. We find our communities are able to resolve. And back to that toolbox, in the two communities we tested it with, the feedback we got from all sides, regardless if you are moms demand liberty or you're the PTA, from all sides was we want more. This was extremely helpful. And now we're having this opportunity to actually test it more broadly in five communities as well. So again, we do the small 
and we do the big at the same time. And that's what we're asked to do as two mediators. Did that answer the question about polarization? Well, it does very much. Oh. And I, you know, one of the things that we've been arguing for quite some time is that the way that you deal with these problems is on a local scale. And part of our national problem is for a variety of reasons, political reporting has been nationalized and syndicated. So it's all just a few big stories and local news is in big trouble. And a lot of the local reporting that we used to see is now gone. Um, one of the things that we've been trying to do is collect a series of, if it exists, it must be possible stories. And that a lot of the things that you're describing are the kinds of things that an awful lot of people would say, no, nah, that had never happened. And I'm wondering whether you've had a chance to put together some, maybe reporters have done this for you, some short readable stories of how some of these things have really worked and enabled communities to deal with very dangerous uh, conflicts in constructive ways. And that, you know, if those stories can be shared more widely, and they're all the kinds of things that if it could be done there, it could be done here, um, is the kind of thing that I think can give people hope, which a big part of our problem is people have sort of, too many people have given up and have decided that the system is irretrievably busted. There are several amazing points. In, in that in that question, sir, uh, the first one that we do is we don't ask people what party you're affiliated with. We don't ask people what religion you're from. We don't ask people what school you go to. We just let them reveal themselves to us. And therefore, we're not putting our definition of those labels on folks. So one of the things that I um, have concern about is when we want to bring different sides together. And so we label what that side is. And every time I've tried to take their surveys, they end up not completing it because I don't fit into a box. And most people don't. And I think it's back to our culture where we want to. And this is something you recently published about the them, the them and us, right? We want to be able to define them. So that must be who they are. Because the moment we see some of that them is similar to us, oh my. <laughs> now what do we do with that? Uh, when it comes to the stories, we do every, in particular, and again, this is with uh, JAM Foundation funding, with when we take on significant issues, like when we do the immigration issues, our members who do that then do tell their stories through webinars and through what we call national products that go out there to help our members able to advance their work with those topics. When we've tried to, so maybe you all can help with this or someone who listens to this, try to put it out on a more broader scale, it gets picked up only in very small weeklies. And, and I just think we, we are counter-narrative in the work we're doing. What you're saying, sir, oh, people aren't going to believe it. Maybe they don't want to. And therefore, if it got picked up on a bigger scale, they, they would need to. I can tell you that we have tried over and over again. And if you know a pathway, because the part of our job is to amplify their voice. If you know a pathway, please, we're open to it. We're, we're very uh, blessed and honored with lots of national groups that are trying to help us do that, uh, give us those platforms so our centers are recognized. What, what we do, and again, this is our culture, what I hear, well, that's true for that center, but not for the one 30 miles away. And I'm like, you're right, it's not. Because back to the original conversation, how open is the judicial system to this? How open are their leaders to this? How much re based resources do they get so they can spend the time doing this type of work? If you don't have enough based resources, then you have to do the work that brings in those resources. So what I get is, okay, that center did it, but the one I went to didn't. Yeah, you're right. So my answer is, so how are you going to help that one that didn't get there? How are you going to work with them in a way that elevates them, hears them, and moves them to deal with the issue? Or second question, maybe where you want them to be isn't where the community needs to be. So how about you let them be where they are? 
and go find a community that wants to be where you would like to fund or you would like to have them be. It's recognizing that each community is different. Their needs are different and how they're going to approach it is different. And back to how the only thing that was put in our centers back in the 60s, you can come to any agreement you want. It just can't be illegal. That was it. So they didn't say you must come to this type of agreement or that. You must make sure this happens or that. It just couldn't be illegal. And that level of breath allowed those in the conflict to really lean into it, sit with it. And if we look at the early information and Kennesaw State University is doing a subset evaluation of this, if we look at that early information, the people ended up doing more together than the court would have asked either side to do. And they kept going forward with what they agreed to because you didn't tell them to do it. They said, this is how we're going to do it. It is amazing when you have people create their own pathway forward, how much they will follow that. And a lot of the polarization, sir, in my mind, goes back to the founding of our country, coming here from Kentucky, where if you were west of the Appalachians, you really had no merit. You weren't going to be listened to. You weren't well-educated enough. You weren't connected enough. So this polarization is embedded in the very creation of at least of this country. I can't speak to Canada, of this country. So to me, how did we continue to grow and evolve? We did by taking the time to see each other, listen to each other, and allow those communities to make the choices that are right for those communities. And I think that that natural tension has always been there. So when you say, oh, it's never been this polarized, I'm like, then you mustn't study history. <laughs> that tension has always been there. What I think has happened is that polarization has now come to the doorstep of people that have access to communication protocol, that have access to political power, and therefore they're able to say, whoa, there's this polarization as long as it remained in those communities that didn't have that type of access, it was very easy to say it wasn't there. And so my challenge to people is when they say the world's polarized, I say, welcome to our world. Now let's sit with it and figure out how we want to work with it. Because it is what it is. And here's the plus of being polarized. The plus. We have passionate people that care passionately about this issue. I'm doing one of your readings again moving them to their interest, where they move to their interest, then frees them up to say, maybe we're not as polarized as we thought we were now that we're sitting together talking about this. Keeping them in their positions allows the polarization to continue. So the question I pose to you and those who may listen to this, who benefits? from allowing and encouraging people to stay in those positions because those are the systems that need to be changed. And those are the systems most threatened by what you wrote that said, we need to move to interest and away from position. Well, I think you're right. Um, we certainly have been polarized for a long time. I think what's different now in my mind is social media that makes things look so much worse than they actually probably are. And it accelerates all sorts of feedback loops. So as where in the old days before we had social media, rumors would travel, but much more slowly. Um, hate speech and was always there, but it wasn't broadcast the way it is now. Everything is with social media, everything just moves so much faster. And, and, and it's hard to verify it. I was watching commercials. I'm sorry, hey, go ahead. Well, it, it moves faster and going along with your notions, hard to verify. There's been, I've read studies that show that, oh, I don't remember the numbers, but 50 to 80% of the 
divisive speech on the web is either bots or actual people from North Korea and Russia who are being very successful in tearing us apart. So that's what I think is new, is that we have these new technologies that are making these problems much more difficult to get a handle on than they used to be. And, and I think, if I can, the three things. One, it's an algorithm to make you find friends. So it's going to find people who say something similar to you. Right. And next you know, you're in a circle of friends that all think the same way. So you think the whole world thinks that way because they're the only people coming in and you don't realize that algorithm was out there searching for people who thought like you. And so you weren't, weren't even people. Exactly, exactly. And, and um, a personal example, uh, just with the, the bank failure in California, my, I don't know why, but my social media blew up. That this, you better get your money at the bank. You better run. You better do it. There's this bank. I was getting it nonstop that I ended up blocking, blocking, blocking all these things that were sent to me. Clearly, the algorithm wanted someone like me and others who may fit my profile to believe there was going to be a huge bank crash. At the end of the day, I went and did my own search of reliable sources read about what the federal government was trying to do, who may be facilitating the yelling that there's this huge bank crash happening, and decided I'm going to wait this out. If I hadn't done that, if I just relied on my social media, I really would have thought that when Monday opened, we were back in 19, was it 29, and had this bank crash. And so everything you're saying is so on point about this reliance on social media that really got exasperated during the COVID period of the pandemic because we're locked inside. And again, while it has been great, another gift that we received again from the Jams Foundation is the Zoom account so that our centers could all swiftly move to Zoom, move online, keep things interactive, keep things going that now has served such an amazing purpose of decreasing cost for people, especially in rural parts of our country, that couldn't take the whole day off. You can go to a mediation, but here they can go to their library and get in a room and get on a Zoom account and participate fully. We've had people in different parts of the country, especially around children issues, where parents and guardians move, able to use these Zoom accounts. So again, the, the benefactor the jams has been for us in allowing our members to get these accounts has worked against the social media thing you brought up, Heidi. If we're locked in, we're trapped in. Now you have this whole Zoom account where you can interface, meet other people, save your volunteers, keep your energy up, and realize there's a whole variety of opinions out there. Well, Zoom was one of the few benefits of the pandemic that we've been very appreciative of. If it weren't for Zoom, we wouldn't be doing this right now. So that's great. Um, two answers and then maybe a question uh, to your question about how to help get the word out about some of the things that are happening. This is one of the things really that we at VI are trying to do now. We have this sense that there's a tremendous amount happening in this country to strengthen democracy. So many people are wringing their hands and saying, we're doomed, there's gonna be a civil war, everything's awful. And we have become aware over the last year or two of just so many positive things that are happening in the other direction, but they're by and large invisible. And what we have always been about with Beyond Intractability and CR Info before that was to make conflict resolution, peace building efforts visible and understandable so that people can have hope. Yes. Um, and, and we think that hope is, is really central. So we want to get the stories out so that we would love to get some of your stories out. However, and we could talk about this off video, but I, I think we would be very interested in being helpful in that regard. 
The other thing that comes to mind is the Solutions Journalism Network. Are you familiar with them? Yes. Um, yes. They really are trying to get stories of this kind out. So I would suspect that there would be a good opportunity to collaborate with them. And we've been really impressed with their work. Um, so it might be worth talking to some folks there. We've had some uh, very good initial conversations and, and certainly hoping that that will, that will grow. Yeah, um, I've just been, I'm, it was started, I think, by Amanda Ripley, who I think is really very important and admirable journalist, but um, yep. she's moved on and it's other good people are there. She's doing interesting things, but I think that that's a good partner for both of us to try to get the positive story out. Um, my question would be, um, do you want to take a few minutes and maybe tell a couple of the stories now? A uh, couple stories about particular community mediation centers who have grappled with some of these big issues. When Guy asked the question about little issues, I was listening to homelessness and voter access. And I was thinking just like you were, well, well that's not a little issue. Um, so just choose one or two where you think community mediation centers have grabbed onto something that most people would look at and say, oh, that's impossible. And they did the impossible. I, I thank you for the invitation. My, uh, my desire would be plant a seed with the two of you that perhaps you can get a few of the centers together and you can talk with them yourself and really hear their amazing stories because they are amazing. One of the, I end many of my calls with them that I'm both honored and blessed to serve as their president because I get to hear these stories and I know I can't do anything in these towns. I live here in Louisville, Kentucky, but I get to do them because I'm supporting these amazing centers from Alaska to Hawaii to Puerto Rico to Nebraska and every place in between doing absolutely amazing work, uh, whether it be with the indigenous nations to immigrants, whether it be with policing, older adults, young adults, marginalized adults. We, they do the work that the community presents to them as a need and saying, this is what, this is the significant need. Do you have the capacity to assess? and help us create the vision we have for our community. So my rather would be, not that I don't have the story, I do. I'd rather set up a part two and let you hear it directly from them. So you can ask them, how did that happen? Who'd you go to? What, what facilitated that? Because what I know is what I remember they told me. And that means I've lost some of the stuff they've already told me just by right. my memory. Well, that makes sense. We, so we certainly be so with that, that, definitely, if we can, um, in any way we can get the word out, I think what I, what I would want people to know is that these centers aren't doing the impossible. They're helping people do what is possible, that they themselves have disempowered themselves in, that they themselves have felt, I can't do, you can. The only reason why you can't is because you're telling yourself or there's some voice in your head that someone else told you you can't. Many times we talk about that voice in the head, that experience, that trauma that tells you, I can't do this. And we're saying, yeah, you can. And again, our job is to help people enhance those skills back to our vision that community mediation is community mobilization. That the reason why we exist is so that you won't need us. You will learn these skills, be able to sit with your own family. And again, when that conflict bubbles up, go, hey, remember when we had that mediation? Remember when we were in that circle? Remember when we were being coached by, let's try that one again and see if it works. And it does work. So actually what our centers do is help people embrace the possibility and not be afraid of it. Because sometimes it is easier to say it's impossible, so I don't have to own 
my accountability for why it's still impossible. Absolutely. And I get that from other groups that they, DG, I can't keep trying to figure out where your members are. That's impossible. They should just contact me. And I say, no, they're busy doing the work of the community. And if you want entree into that community, then knock on their door. Because so many times what the door they'll knock on is what we call the grass top. And our centers are working and sitting in the grass root. And if you want sustainable change, you've got to make sure the roots are healthy. Does that, so have I planted the seed? Can we have a session in the future with some of the centers and you meet them? I would, I would love that. I think you would enjoy them. They would enjoy meeting the two of you. And you could then get those stories almost firsthand yourself. That sounds great. That'd be great. Um, you also, I think, said earlier that you had some webinars that you share with um, members, and I'm wondering if those would be something that would be valuable to share more broadly. Uh, some are share more broadly. Well, what we share broadly is our podcast, and we share broadly what we call community nation moments where uh, the center will talk for a few minutes about something special they're doing, something special they're about. And then you can follow up with them. Say, hey, I want to know more how you did that. We leave all the others um, to our members only, uh, partly because at the end of the day, being a membership organization, there needs to be a benefit to membership. Right. And while our other members, as you can tell, we have very few foundations that fund us. We are funded mostly through our members. And so that that benefit of membership still needs to be present for folks. Yeah. Um, so I know that sounds horribly selfish. Um, it, what, what I share with people is if we if we did that and then NAFCOM disappeared, there would be no national group housing those webinars. There would be no national group bringing these things together that helps us advance all of us. So it's sort of if you want this national depository to help advance the work, then we need you to chip in some resources, however you feel you can do that. So I hope that doesn't sound horribly selfish. No, it doesn't. We completely mm -hmm. understand that. But now, is, is there a way that interested people could have, you know, what does it take to join to be a member to have access to that? You have to be an organization or you can just be somebody who's interested in this. We have what we call associates, and those are people who believe in the commission principles. And so they become a member. Uh, it's very reasonable. It's $110 a year. And you get access to all the webinars we do, all the library, all the current research that's being stored in there including some of your articles that we found in our virtual library. And so you can figure out what's best for you to get that information. Uh, we do have organizations that become institutional members. We are very honored to have universities across the country that have chosen to become an institutional member of NAFCOM. So their students have access to this. So when they're doing research papers, when they're trying to figure things out, they can go right to what we call a virtual library and to our webinars to say what's going on and then able to then make phone calls to those presenters and say, I want to follow up. You did this webinar on X. Can you tell me more about that? We just had Michael Lang, I'm sure you know him, give an amazing webinar yesterday. Absolutely amazing. Our members are there, thrilled to have it. And therefore, his words are now being part of our aggregated wisdom and you can learn more what he has to say in his team and then perhaps contact him. So we don't we don't find it unreasonable. Institutional members is, uh, I think it's 375, and that allows you to have broad access, all your students. Associate membership would allow one person to have access in your team to what's in there. Um, so we try to keep it really small and not a barrier, but it needs to be something so that that we can still stay. Well, the thing that I find most inspirational about this whole conversation is that you paint a picture of a society that benefits from and knows how to handle conflict constructively. Uh, right now, I think in too much of the United States and probably a lot of other places, people are so repelled at the notion that somebody disagrees with them that they just want to defeat them. 
And what this is, is a story of how we can learn from all of our differences at a local scale, work through problems, solve problems. And really, you know, the, this is one of the key features of democracy is a, a system for constructively handling conflict. And one of the advantages of our system with so many levels of jurisdiction from the local to the state to the federal is that problems can be handled locally. We don't really need to have a one size fits all national solution. And, and I think and this is a model for doing that. Sir, I wanna to go to another writing you all did. Sorry, I did a deep dive in your writings before we met. Uh, and you, one of your most recent ones about, was about Stanford and what happened there. And while it may be nice that they're making people take a course down sort of like indoctrination, it would have been even sustainably, I think, more effective to brought in community meetings to sit with all the individuals and talk through the genesis of that anger, where that's coming from, the ability to hear each other, that at the end of the day, you can have people with differing, extremely different point of views and be able to sit and listen to them or choose not to but you don't need to be protesting them in a way that shuts them down. We view protests as positive. It's people going out there testifying that I'm for something and the word pro I'm for test from testimony. So we see it as very positive, but protesting doesn't mean shutting someone down. Protesting means I want you to hear what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. And that resolution doesn't seem to set that up in a way that if they would also enhance that reaction the university did with bringing in these commission principles, I think they would set a culture on the campus that would be much more sustainable in how do we behave appropriately when someone's saying something we find very offensive. As someone who is still grieving what occurred Monday in my city, I still hear people say things that hit me really wrong what we're going through but I don't yell at them. I don't, I don't try to diminish them. The worst I've done is say, please know your facts. That's all I've asked them to do. Because they have the right to hold that truth as upsetting as I find it based on what my city's going through. I have the right to say, please know your facts. And in that conversation, that interaction, I'm not calling anyone out. I'm not shaming anybody. I'm not shutting anyone down. That I would add on to that layer of what the university plans on doing, have you thought about? This is really a system in your law school. So maybe there needs to be some system cultural change beyond offering a course. And I and that's something that you had written most recently about that that was what they were doing. So again, I, I hope that's okay. Does it creep you out that I did a deep dive into your writing? Well, that's fine. Okay. And, and I was thinking as I was listening to that, that I want to take out that part of the, this transcript and put it as a post, postscript to that article because one of our goals that has been partially met, but we certainly like to do it a lot more, is to we started this thing that we called a discussion and it's a blog at the same time and it ended up also being the Substack newsletter. Uh, so there's three entities that are all pretty much the same thing, but we really want it to be a discussion where it's not just us putting forth, but getting a back and forth. And we've had some back and forth, but we haven't had nearly as much as we were hoping for. So anytime somebody does make a comment on one of the posts. I'm really eager to get it up and out there so that we can encourage more conversation. And of course, we've gotten a, several private emails about that Stanford uh, post because First Amendment issues are particularly difficult and sticky and very much on a lot of people's minds right now. And there isn't agreement at all about how to deal with it. But I think having a back and forth on that's really valuable. I, I think if they were able to actually go through a really good process that could be, because something else you wrote in there that really is a truism for me is today you may have the power to decide who says the good things and says the bad thing. And a few years from now, maybe the other person has the power and you're now labeled as saying the bad thing. 
So we need to be able to, as my dad used to say, put our big boy pants on and sit with stuff and listen to it and not take it personally as an attack on us, but really debate the ideas, debate the 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 solution and the resolution that's going forward. People aren't going to see and recognize you if you're slamming and harming them. All they're going to see and recognize is that you're harming me. If what you want is for people to see and recognize you, then let them see and recognize you in a way that challenges them to say, maybe I need to think about you all a little differently. I don't know whether you um, went from that our article to read Judge uh, Duncan's telling of what happened. And it was just textbook escalation. The students started doing what they were doing and he started calling them names and so they got worse. Oh my gosh, it was just textbook. So ugly all around, it was amazing. And and to me, that's where it would benefit if judges had communication training. (laughs) The training itself would have said that probably wasn't the best way to respond to that. Um, and again, that 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 is what I would answer. I do want to say I'm glad we got to meet because I've never responded. I read your stuff. I never respond because based on your background, the things you two have done, the decades of difference the two of you have made, I've never felt like anything I could say oh. would really add to it. So I've never got to meet because I'm like, okay, maybe next time I will respond to something yes, I'm reading. Please. So, yeah, I'm really glad. Encourage others to, um, because really we just, we want to be a facilitator. We want to be a vessel where a conversation can take place um, because we are blessed by having a pretty wide readership. Uh, We reach a lot of people, but we really, Beyond Attractability wasn't written by us. It was written by 500 people, half scholars, half practitioners, probably the 500 numbers outdated now. We're probably up to closer to six. There's a lot of people who've got into that and we want to keep it going. Just, It's sort of like a community mediation center writ large. It's a place where our whole field and allied fields can have a conversation about how to do this better. And we don't have the answers. Uh, Any way I can help, and that can help, let, please let me know how we can amplify your voice. I'm thinking of uh, possibly having you all attend a Momentum May. It's, it, we meet once a month, once a year virtually just to talk about hot topics as a group and have some fun together. It's a lot of games. And you may even uh, participate or come to the assembly and get to sit with some of these folks. I think sitting with you has has made me go, I think I can respond to what you're writing. And when I read your work and read your bio, it's like, yeah, I, I'm nowhere near that. There's no point wading into those waters. So anyway, we can lift you up and get people to know you. So, Because we have so many members way beyond the centers. We have thousands and thousands of people that follow the stuff that we do. If we can open the door to, to your voice and what you're doing, I'd be more than honored to do that on your behalf. Well, that's great. great. We would really appreciate it. And I am sort of dismayed to hear that you were intimidated. I hope other people aren't. We might have to do some sort of a post that says, please don't be intimidated. (laughs) You you, you both have made quite a difference. Uh, It hadn't occurred to me that that would have been an issue. Uh, We've always had a really strange place in the field because we've only practiced a little bit, so we're not considered practitioners. Uh, We haven't done what is considered serious research, Uh, haven't had a tenured position ever at a university, we've been adjuncts. So we're not considered scholars, we're not considered practitioners, nobody knows what to do with us. And we go to conferences and we don't have a group where we're one of them. We're always kind of these weirdo people. So it never- I think communication may have been your home. Intimidating weirdo people. I, I think communication may have been your home. I think I think we've found a place where your 
your way of sitting with things fits very well with what we really are encouraging and supporting our folks to do in both Canada and the U.S. So maybe maybe you found a home, I'm just saying. Yeah, well, we um, have practiced it a little bit just because we felt into it and certainly our heart's been in the right place and I got a little bit of training oh my gosh it, well in the 80s I guess um, <laughs> when I was just out of grad school I worked with a forerunner of a community mediation center here in Boulder um, and we were doing we weren't doing the kinds of mediation that you're describing, I don't think, although you may have some centers who are doing what we were doing. We were doing fairly large scale environmental conflicts over whether dams were gonna be built and water treatment plants were gonna be built and that kind of thing. Um, and I don't remember if you were, I think you were in the local intersections meeting on Tuesday where Susan Carpenter, yep. that was what we were talking about because she was head of the organization that I work with where um, I got some training from them but never really did a whole lot with it. And all of that was irrelevant and I shouldn't have gone there. But anyway. Uh, um, we, the thing it, that's, um, we've been lucky is that in this sort of weird position that we have, we get a bit of a sense of what we collectively know. And we live in a world that's hyper-specialized, even in the dispute resolution, conflict resolution, peace building field, that it's so much effort to do one small handle, one small dispute. And I, um, and by small, I don't necessarily, and it's just one that involves a relatively few people it can have great impact and great importance. Um, it's hard to see the big picture. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we've been doing and been part out of Walt Roberts uh, Intersections Project um, is to start to put together more of a map of all of the things that are happening. And it's really very encouraging and it's not something that's widely visible. Um, and it, it cuts two ways so that some people mm. think that if I do my little thing here and I bring 10 Democrats to dinner with 10 Republicans, I can solve the polarization problem in the United States. And there's other people who will say, I'm gonna bring 10 Democrats together with 10 Republicans and have them have dinner and it won't have any impact. And so I, I no point in doing it at all. And obviously both of those assumptions are wrong. Um, that's what we're trying to do is to give the notion that we're each a piece of right. this puzzle. And that's if right. each of us fills in a small piece and we become aware of the fact that we're one piece of a great big puzzle, then we can make that puzzle come together. Um, it's, it's the lack of awareness of what else that is going on that I think is leaving people astray in both directions. And absolutely, and part of um, that's something we're trying to embrace back to our original work founding in the 70s was to be that infrastructure. So people could come and find, what are you doing? What are you doing around this issue or that issue? I'm not sure they always called it social justice or peace or or social cohesion, but they were talking about and figuring it out. And that's why National Art created because as it evolved and people were moving our work into a program so it's nice and neat and fit, it then lost the ability to be that systemic structure where everyone could come together and lift each other up. The point of the center isn't to shade anyone's work. Point of the center is to lift up everyone's work and then figure out where the gaps are. And, and we at the community, do we want to fill those gaps? Are we able to? Maybe we're not right now. Maybe we can. But never assume that there's a gap because no one's doing it. When you have a gap, the first thing is let's talk to people, let's do a spider web. And fair, is anyone doing that? 
because maybe they're doing it really well and they're so busy doing it, they don't have time with the world now. Well, yeah. then our job would be to lift them up because now we have a new resource. Remember, our thing is to help people lean into their conflict. Well, if we get a new resource out there doing something and a conflict comes to the center, that resource may be the best place for them to actually sit with their conflict. Well, then why not refer them to them? So it, it is something we've been trying to get back to since 1994, and it's been a slow progress back to why we were created in the first place. And so to end with polarization, I don't think people in the 60s thought the world would be any more polarized than it was then. When you had the riots going on, the murders going on, the civil rights movement, the war movement, and that's when we were born. That's when we were growing. And so our DNA as centers fit well in the type of atmosphere where conflict is very visible. And in fact, part of our job is to make it more visible because when there is appearance of no conflict, it could be because you have what is that negative piece. There's no conflict because people are afraid to speak up. They're afraid to say anything. They're afraid to, wow, it looks so wonderfully peaceful here. And part of our job is, is it really? Let's, let's lift this up and let's figure out because then the day conflict is needed to help us evolve and grow and continue to change to become better. That is our progress as individuals. That's our progress as community. Is always to evolve, to become better, to become that vision of yourself you had. And so with that in mind, that infrastructure needs to embrace that. And that doesn't mean becoming a program. And so that is really that that challenge for the members I represent is if the only funding you can receive is to be a program, then how much time do you have being that systems infrastructure you were supposed to be? And and again, that is where they believe NAFCOM's needed. Let's get them resources so they can be that infrastructure they're supposed to be and offer programs or connect them to people that are offering these great programs. They don't have to offer them and do that. So I realized that hour and a half flew. I want to thank you for it. Well, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. You've shared a lot of amazing information and given us a lot of avenues to follow up on. Great. So we will be doing that. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for this gift. And one last thought is that this history that we've been talking about for the last hour and a half came out of a period of even more intense conflict in the 60s and 70s. Yep. So part of what happens when conflicts get bad is people figure out how to deal with it. And now there's a new generation to write another chapter of the story. Right. That's right. Absolutely. And you're giving the platform for people to know that it's a continuation. And, and to me, there's some comfort knowing it isn't this hasn't happened before. It has. So let's re-embrace how we got through it the last time and make it even better this time. Because hopefully the better it is, we make it sustainable. And don't try to turn it into a program. Don't say it's over. It's never over. It's in our DNA. So let's make this sustainable and make it better. So thank you. Thank you both for this opportunity. Well, thank you.